Hello and welcome to um, another episode, um, depending on how you're watching this, of Steel Fur Speaks. Um, and, you know, a while ago I said I was going to start doing these sort of videos covering flesh and blood a bit more, talking about that. And I think one of the things is, so I mean, I, I recorded myself opening a few boxes that really wasn't gelling with me in terms of content it really wasn't um you know and everyone has these box opening videos it's really not my style like i don't want to brag about what i've got um i'm happy when i open something shiny but it's not really you know my goal now maybe when i'm opening something like a first edition which i know will have a lot more hype and a lot of people won't be able to afford first edition and you know as far as things currently stand i'm looking at maybe getting 10 boxes not really sure uh we'll see how that sort of pans out um i know that some of those orders may not actually come through um i'm speaking to the stores that i have them with to see whether or not they are um getting that because there's been heavy allocation um in the uk but you know we'll talk about that because i'm doing another video that i'm recording after this um i don't know which one i'll publish first about why you should play flesh and blood and why it's an interesting time to get into the game and that's not really to do with first edition but it is to do with um just the feel of the game and how you know the fact that certain deck building options are limited um increases your um ability to sort of get into the game and um collect it in a way that lets you play the classes you want without spending a lot of money um and that's kind of interesting so and that kind of does tie into the topic of today's video which i've been promising for a while um and i know some of you are still waiting for me to finish my core cycle one and two review of l5r which i will be doing um i might record an episode this weekend because i want to get that finished and wrapped up um and obviously the reason that that has been delayed is that any l5r time i have had free um for a certain period went into the work i've been doing with the continuing committee business for l5r um where we've you know reached the stage where we've picked people out from all the applications people have settled in uh, chopped and changed a few things you know and and sort of the team now is starting to i would say get momentum towards understanding what the project entails i wouldn't say reaching the point where they're doing stuff and i don't want to speak for them and i'm sure they'll have announcements but obviously with all these sorts of projects there is a lot of groundwork to be laid i've been helping with that and that's taken i would say my help of our budget that i was originally going to spend on that video series um, but I am looking forward to getting back to it now over the next week or two. Um, I know some people have been asking for them and they are very much the sort of like thought piece content that I enjoy doing for a game. And I enjoy certainly doing it for L5R. Um, so I will get back to that next week. Um, may, may record an episode this weekend. But at the moment, we're here to talk about L5R and we're here to talk about um, the LCG model and the TCG model um, in general. And you've got obviously the LCG model, which is copyrighted we have that logo there from from fantasy flight games and we also have other lcgs that just aren't you know called lcgs but they're still lcgs so we really you don't need to get complicated about that um call a spade a spade a living card game is a living card game it doesn't really matter who publishes it um ffg's lawyers you can do whatever you like i don't care um because you know this is just a fact and then of course we have the trading card game which is the you know the iconic the classic and the, the main difference between them for those who don't know who never played an lcg before and all you've heard of is um pokemon magic um you know flesh and blood whatever um the the primary difference is that a, a trading card game is more of a random uh based system you buy a pack from a set the set has a certain number of cards the pack has a certain number of cards of certain rarities buy a certain number of packs to get a certain number of cards there's distribution and essentially it's a bit of a gamble you could get big and get the big hit and because there are random distributions of cards certain cards are worth more of you know theoretically the breakdown is that if a box is worth x and the odds of pulling a card are y then the value of a card should be based on a percentage of its likelihood of being pulled from a box so you know um you know if a box is worth 70 pounds and you are guaranteed to get a card um then it's kind of like a one in 70 so maybe it's worth like two or three quid because you're going to get one in every single box um whereas if there's one card that shows up in say 50 boxes you know then you start to get up to the price of maybe 400 quid because it would take you roughly five boxes to buy it so obviously um you know there's there's a value there it's called um 
oh, there's the term for it. What is it? Expected value from a box. But it, you know, it's just a calculation of how much a card is worth. Often that's how it works out. Often it's just supply. You know, the first time someone smacks down a certain amount for a card, everyone thinks they're going to pay that. If people keep smacking down that amount for the card, then it sells for that much. And that's just how much the card is worth. That's TCG's limited supply of certain rares, chase rares, they're called, means that um, people will buy more of the product um, and not everyone will be able to get all the cards. Uh, living card game um, is kind of the polar opposite. So um, packs are released. Each of those packs has a set um, card containment. Um, so, you know, you might have 100 cards in a pack. Those cards will all be play sets. So three cards, four cards, however many the game lets you play. Um, and you'll pay a set fee, which is, I think, in the games I've played, £15 um, for each of the packs, and you'll get a play set for £15. So, um, you know, you have that comparison. Um, one game, everyone gets a play set of everything just as a price of buying the cards. Uh, and in the other one, um, people get, you know, say, a distribution of cards based on um, whether or not they're going to do that. So, you know, if we go to, like, random magic booster draw generator i'm sure we can find something here magic the gathering sealed deck generator okay cool let's bring this up so you can see what i'm seeing all right now let's just say like so we go to time spiral remastered um uh, generate my sets okay and i'll do this and you'll see that in this i'll pick six packs up that i'll get a random sorry just gonna I'll get a random distribution of cards, some rares, um, some commons, and this means that there's a sealed format um, that every deck is different, and some people will get the good cards and some people won't, and you know there'll be a good mix of of different cards in each pack, and I can build different decks every six packs I open, and the whole like sealed sealed aspect, which is quite a big deal. Um, whereas if we look at you know a similar LCG, if we go to like Five Rings DB. Um, and, and this is important. So if we look at Time Spiral then remastered as a set, so Time Spiral remastered database um, of every card. Uh, I'm sure there's a place here that has a card gallery. Uh, yeah, okay. So if this is a card gallery of this, and I want to know how many cards are in the set. I'll look that up in a second. So if we go to something like Legend of the Five Rings, so famous LCG recently completed slash cancelled. Um, my username is unsurprisingly Steelfur, but you don't know my password, so that's all right. And if we go to cards and we go to specific sets, so let's just do, uh, let's just do Imperial Cycle. I can't remember how this works, to be honest. Uh, let's just go to the other one. Let's go to Bushi Builder. That does it a bit more text based. Five Rings DB has a, a bit more functionality, but Bushi Builder's got a bit more, um, a bit more text based. Uh, so we go to sets or cycles and we'll go to, you know, um, so one of these cycles will be about the equivalent of, of a set. Um, and if you look at the size of, say, Time Spiral Remastered, mm -hmm, um, size of MTG set. There we go. So yeah, if you look at the size of an MTG set, you'll see 200, 300. Seems to be a good average number, maybe 250. And then maybe 100, depending on the set. Okay, we can look at that. Maybe total cards, 300. And if we look at the number of cards that are in an L5R set, you'll see there is actually a drastically lower number. Um, in terms of individual cards, there'll be about um, about 80, 90. Um, and there are some reasons for this, of course. And I think this is important as part of the discussion is that the, if we look at the origins of the LCG, let's just turn that off for a second and just return to talk about this. So TCGs exist. They've been successful for about 25 years. And the earliest LCG, I believe, was coined in 2008. Eight. It was Call of Cthulhu, the card game based on Lovecraft, and it was the LCG model was created as basically people were getting frustrated with this idea of buying booster packs, blind buying, 
um, spending lots of money to maybe get the cards. And they very much felt that it would be better if that board game model of purchasing cards came um, to a head and, you know, you just bought basically what are mini expansions for board games, but treated it like a card game instead. Okay, the TCU model has obviously proved its success. Um, and the main difference between them is that essentially um, it comes down to money, right? Um, a TCG, people buy more cards than they actually theoretically need because not only do they buy cards when the set comes out, they might buy cards whenever they're in a shop. They play sealed with cards and stuff, which they may not need for their collection, but they enjoy sealed. Um, they buy cards for speculation to maybe try and get a good card if the value of a box is high and they think they can get cards that are worth something to to store or to trade and there's a massive collector's market trading in cards that have value so that whole secondary market of buying selling cards um really money is probably the big difference if you look at the lcg model because everyone has money uh there is money in the promos there is money in alternate art cards and special promotional cards from world championships and stuff like that but there isn't money in the actual cards themselves and the amount of revenue that they generate for the company that makes them is significantly different as well and that's important to remember um it, because an lcg player may buy everything but even if you look at four or five years of an LCG, you might be talking about five, six hundred pounds. A meta deck for Magic the Gathering in standard, for example, might cost you four or five hundred pounds. And when a new set comes out, you might drop three or four hundred pounds to buy boxes of that set um, or to play on sealed of all these various things. So the amount of money being made by both stores um, and the creators of the company or a trading card game is automatically just higher because more product is being sold and that in turn um increases the amount of value that is available to invest so there's kind of a few points i want to get into here and i kind of want to lay out this segmentation um as we go a bit deeper into this so you've had a bit of the the glossy of what is an lcg what is a tcg um obviously it comes down to blind buying random booster packs um larger sets um, with a lot more unwanted cards in um to flash out for sealed and things like that versus everyone gets everything set purchases you know exactly what you're getting to dig down a bit deeper there's kind of three main things i want to look at so i want to look at player experience both in terms of how people get into the game and what it feels like as a player i want to look at company experience in terms of resources invested and return on investment and i want to look at longevity and basically this idea of success um value of your collection long term and and that kind of thing so to break down sort of player experience um we'll start off with sort of in terms of playing the games i wouldn't say there's an amazingly different experience it just depends on the mechanics of the game um you know a lot of lcgs that have been created for their own reasons have more complicated mechanics just because they come from board game companies like fantasy for light games um, but if you look at something like Ashes Reborn, which is an LCG by a different name because it's trademarked, you know, that one very much has a I have a champion, I cast spells, I summon creatures, magic feel to it. Um, so, you know, it's not to say that there's a major difference in terms of gameplay. Um, but then if we look at something like um, player experience in terms of new player experience, so let's talk about trying the game. Okay, and this is where we start to run into real friction. So to try a trading card game, you can go and buy a starter deck, fine, um, from the latest set. You can draft for £10. You can play sealed for £30. Um, you can play a, uh, basically play a, a non-constructed event where everyone is on an equal playing field, and that's the draft and the sealed, where you might theoretically have a chance. Now, obviously, skill plays a big role, but you theoretically have a chance to be on an equal playing field as everyone else. And you can do that a couple of times once a week, you know, until you have a decent collection and maybe you get into pauper. So, you know, the, the, the common based magic set uh, where everything costs two or three quid and you build that common deck and everyone's happy. Or you get into only playing sealed, so you keep your cost low. Or maybe you do decide to get into standard and you start keeping up with the meta and you are spending that money, but you're happy because the initial try you had was £10 and, and that's fine. It's that initial sort of get you in the door and suddenly you're like, well, this is the best thing and I've made some friends. I need to come back. I need to keep playing this game. And, you know, that's fantastic, right? That, that, that level of entry, that cost investment. 
Then let's turn to LCGs. Um, the only LCG, so most LCGs start off with a core set, cost £25. Pretty much traditionally every single LCG except for um, that Fantasy Flight have made for at least, except for the Marvel card game, has come with not a full playset of every card in that set. You had to buy multiple um, core sets, you know, and that was done for reasons. Um, but basically the idea was you had to buy multiple core sets to get a playset of the core cards. And, you know, there were some where this was very egregious, like Netrunner, where um, two boxes would get you all but three copies of seven cards, or was it 12 cards? And then you had to buy another box to get three of the, the other seven, um, which was ridiculous. Um, uh, Legend of the Five Rings, you just got one of everything, so you just had to buy three of them. Um, and your only real way to play the game was to buy at least one core set, which straight away is £30. And for better or worse, well, just for worse, actually, the core set was not good. So, the, you know, buying one core set is not a good experience of the game because you can't play with full decks. You cannot get a, a proper good experience of the game. Um, the decks you're building are weak and unoptimized. They don't feel great. Um, I know some people play Netrunner one core as a board game, and I've heard good things about that. But for the rest of them, Game of Thrones, uh, Legend of the Five Rings, Arkham Horror, only buying one core set is a suboptimal experience. So typically people advise you buy at least two, if not three. And that's just to start off with. We're talking about £90 to get your first investment in the game. And your first, I mean, you might try the game if friends are playing it, but if you want to actually have your own takeaway product, then we're talking about £30 minimum. And at least, you know, £30 minimum, potentially 90 just to get into the game at a base level and play it with a core set. And remember the core set, you know, for better, well, no, I keep saying for better or worse because I'm trying to be generous to them. But for worse, is not a good play, player experience. Um, an LCG, um, and this is where we start new player experience. So when we take this back to money, right, which we'll, we'll get into more later in terms of how much revenue you can generate from an LCG versus a TCG model. But when it comes down to money, um, the experience you get from buying a box of a TCG versus buying three core sets because of the size of sets versus the size of a set of an LCG. So LCGs are inherently smaller because they have to give out play sets, which means that, and they, and they can only sell it as one product. So the sets are inherently smaller. So because of the size of the sets and the fact that you have to fit everything in one box, the experience of getting into sealed in a TCG versus getting into an LCG um, is drastically different and i would say worse for an lcg i would say most lcgs really start to hit their stride and this sounds quite bad after about a year after about the first actual set has come out after about the second set has come out things start to really hit their stride and in fact that is such the case that most lcgs are tested as basically designed with the first two sets and the core at the same time and then the cards are split up so that really even the game you get the developers were playing um, isn't really complete for two years. And those sets will set you back another £15 a pack, six packs. Um, so that'll be uh, math people in the chat, about another £90, £180 um, to get those that full experience. So then we're talking about, you know, what, 260 quid to get a good gaming experience that I would consider, you know, well-rounded with more balance you know the first year of l5r was great and the first year of a lot of the lcgs i've played has been good but you know certain decks just didn't have the cards they needed to perform they really only started to get fleshed out two years in certain clans were good just because their first group of cards in the core set were good and nothing came to to counteract them so that is really a problem new player entry there was only one attempt, and, and this is quite interesting if you look at how the LCG model has, has, has um, evolved. So there was an attempt during the Game of Thrones 2 era to release starter decks, um, but they didn't really sell very well, so that was never attempted again. But if you look at the way that Marvel Champions is currently running, so a core set is now just a board game price, so it's just £60. But within that £60, you get five full playable decks that you can build, um, you can't have more than two or three of them open at the same time or up at the same time, but you can. And you get three or four villains and it's actually really good value for money. But the important thing is, and this is a lesson that living card games have learned, is that the entry point needed to come down. So actually any 
deck you buy for Marvel Champions is a fully playable deck. So if your friend has a core set and you really like Captain America, you can buy Captain America and play that with your friend and it will have a full deck as well as copies of other cards. So they are kind of learning, but the fact is that still getting into an LCG as a casual player, um, especially any of them that were competitive, um, I would argue there are no competitive LCGs left really, um, except interesting, and this is interesting. So I mentioned in my last video, Ashes Reborn, and Ashes Reborn very much does what um, Marvel Champions does. So I actually have, hold up one second, let's, um, let's go and pull. Because it is, it is actually print day um, and delivery day for Ashes Reborn. So you can see, let's hold them up to the camera. Fantastic art. Um, so this is Ashes Reborn. This is a reprinting and reforging of Ashes 1.0. So they've updated about 30% of the card base and done a 2.0 edition direct uh, on subscription. Um, and, you know, each of these decks, and I think this is important, you see there's a character on the front of all of them. Each of these decks is a deck. Right, it has spare cards, it has spare copies of all the cards you need, but each of them is essentially one deck. And what that means, same as for Marvel Champions, that when you sit down to play, to play one of these decks, you probably need a core set because the core set has the dice, but you can buy the dice separately, right? So you could enter Ashes Reborn if you really liked a specific hero and the way they looked for the price of 10, 12 pounds plus three or four pounds for some dice alternatively you could buy one of the deluxe expansions which come with the dice for that champion and their single dice so for example the um the lawbreaker i think it's lawbreaker or lawmaker expansion brings in justice dice i think and that is both a deck and the dice to play that deck so you could buy one of those for 20 quid that's your entry model so that's that's how lcgs have evolved sadly it didn't evolve quick enough to save any of the competitive LCGs that Fantasy Flight were making, but maybe Ashes Reborn will stick around for a while as a competitive LCG model. Um, we'll really see. I think my takeaway on that in terms of new player entry is, is essentially that it needed to be easier than it was for the majority of LCGs. And even, even if you provide a new player route, because of the quantity of cards and the pace that cards are being made for an LCG, which is often one or two cycles a year, an influx of maybe 180 cards, 200 cards a year or something. Um, rotation never really happens, you know. So whereas in TCGs, because the money is being made to keep printing sets and three sets a year, um, you can rotate. You can take cards out. You can take cards away. With the amount of cards being made for an LCG model and the amount you need to actually reach critical mass in order to actually have a rotation without just ruining the available card pool um the fact is you can never rotate so a problem card is a problem card and one of the things that every lcg i've played has, has suffered from is that that initial core set um which was played in a vacuum without players having it turned out to be either too strong or too weak and then that affected the rest of the game and that rotation never happened so the game died so but also because rotation never happens the buy-in for the game even if you like one deck right so taking Ashes Reborn, again, for an example. So the entry point is good. You can pay £10 or £20 to get into the game. But if you want the rest, that's another £250, £300. Now, you're saying, hey, hey Steelfer, you know, that's not a lot of money compared to you said, I, you, know, you, you said I would spend £300 a set on a trading card game. And you're right, it's not, but it's about mentality of what you get for that. So there isn't that excitement or that ability to buy in small amounts usually with an LCG. It's it's big purchases. If I want everything, I know exactly what I'm getting. There's no excitement. There's no, well, maybe I can pay this purchase off if I open that expensive card. It's just, oh, well, I pay that. And then what's my collection worth? LCGs typically, typically, and I'm going to say this, typically the value of the cards does not increase, right? It does not. Typically, it decreases when they're played, or it remains roughly static because something like Arkham Horror, for example, if you have a full cycle and it's reasonably good quality, um, you can typically because it's because it's like a board game. As long as it's in reasonably good quality, you can typically get most of your money back for that cycle because someone will just buy it from you. You've played it enough. It's sleeved. It's in reasonably good condition, and they want the cards so they're just going to be like okay well i'll give you minus 20 quid or something but give me the whole cycle and they don't want to go and find all the little packs and it, it, there's a good economy and selling on 
you know, I've got enough out of Arkham, so I'm going to sell on my Arkham. Um, and there are some outliers where, because, you know, LCGs don't print as much because it's not as easy to print all of these on-demand packs that are each single products that have to be bought, um, that some LCG products do go out of sale and there is actually a lot of scalping going on at the moment, for example, in the Arkham Horror World, because some of the things, are, some of the cycles are out of print and they will tell stories and people are in lockdown and they want to they see the story and, you know, they're not getting that because it's not being reprinted fast enough. So, you know, LCGs are a whole, they're just a whole problem, right? And I don't feel like the solution was ever really found. But from a player from a player perspective, um, routes of entry was always problematic. Total buy-in was always attractive because you have these TCGs running on and they're like, give me 300 pounds a set. And then you have your LCGs who are just laughing and being like, well, no, give me 100 quid a year. And then, you, you know, you have everything. And it's kind of like, from a player perspective, the LCG is obviously the better model because you you know exactly how much you're spending. You're getting a full complete game. You don't have to spend a lot of time chasing res and all these other things. You're just getting a set thing. And also, and this is kind of important from a player experience, the meta becomes um, very defined and you know controllable and changeable because everyone has the cards. And this is something I kind of want to get into actually, because um, I think we this is the last kind of big point on player experience, right? So you've got two things going on here in terms of supply and demand of cards, right? So in the trading card game world, there are a lot of people who actually enjoy that secondary market. You know, if you look at the likes of, you know, people, I mean, Alpha Investments, for example, as a YouTube channel has made his, his life buying and selling on the secondary market. There's a lot of people who like the idea that they'll open a box and pull out a card that will pay for their, um, for the rest of their cards. A lot of the speculation on, flesh and blood right now on first edition and things like that is based on the premise that if i get enough first edition of the next set maybe i'll pull out a card that can pay for my entire playset of that set you know because some of the cold foils that are only found in first edition you know from arc and work of Wraith are selling for you know six seven thousand pounds right and by that logic, if I open one of those cards, that's going to cover my total investment in flesh and blood. Now, I probably won't, but that's people like that. And people like the time that they can invest in making their collection good, in foiling everything. You know, and that is a huge thing for card games that LCGs completely miss. But there is also this other sinister factor, which is a lot of the time in trading card games, the meta is defined i mean at the very top end this doesn't apply but from the mid to high the meta is not only defined by what cards people want to play but what also what cards are available right so you have people who will go and win tournaments and they won't necessarily win you know they won't necessarily be playing the meta card right so um you know it I can't really think of magic examples. I haven't played magic in ages, but you know, say you don't have the Charizard that everyone's playing from Pokemon, um, uh, or you don't have, you know, the the Command and Conquers in Flesh and Blood. You know, the eighty quid card that you need a playset of three or four, and you're not willing to spend two hundred and forty quid on it. So you're running something else, but suddenly that something else you try becomes innovative and it becomes good and it works, and then you have this meta definition by what people can afford as well as what people want to play um and i've heard it argued now i completely disagree that a meta defined and created by scarcity is actually a good thing because it creates more variety um it creates interest in chase cards it creates interest in trading and it fuels that whole secondary market of trading things that get people interested now personally i would prefer the idea of a meta where your wallet size and your ability to be cunning about getting cards from people and other sort of things doesn't determine how well you can play a game or how good you are at a game but you know let's be realistic you know that is one of the reasons for huge amounts of diversity in card games and that is the one of the reasons why if you look at magic red deck wins is usually good and being played by a lot of people because it's often the cheapest meta deck um, and a lot of people would play that deck regardless because it is a cheap option which in turn then defines the meta right so and you see the same thing in flesh and blood a lot of people would play ninja but all the crucible stuff is expensive all of the um you know the mask of momentum is the most expensive legendary you know, all that kind of stuff, it requires Commander Conquers and E-Strike. So they start playing 
warrior instead because warrior is a good counter for ninja and the cards are slightly less expensive but then warrior is too expensive as well so people think well what's a good counter to warrior and they start playing stuff like wizard or things like that where the cards aren't as expensive and you have more options so in many ways I would agree with the person who said, well, look, actually, you've got to think about this, that TCG card scarcity does create meta, and that is that is valuable. Whereas in an LCG, the best deck is the best deck, and everyone can play it. Um, that's not to say the LCG doesn't have innovation and ability to change. I think an LCG model with a large number of cards does breed the same amount of innovation as a TCG high level meta because remember at the high level meta everyone has the cards and there's not a question of you know the top eight of that tournament didn't all have a playset of command and conquer you know very likely they all had a playset of command and conquer they could build whatever they wanted they just used the best card so at the highest level there's parity between the two but in general you know there is that 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 divide but then Again, in Magic, it has led to other formats like Elder Dragon, where you only need one of every card at EDH, um, the Highlander part of it, Commander, Arena Singleton decks, where you can only have one of any card, Pauper, where everything has to be common. You know, that innovation doesn't necessarily happen in LCGs because everyone has all the cards, and that is definitely a problem. So that kind of covers off player experience. Um, so next up, I really want to go into... Um, well, I guess we'll just talk a small bit about... I know I've already talked about rotation, so let's not talk about rotation. Let's go into actual money that you can make from um, card games, right? So um, I can bring up a spreadsheet. I'm not going to show you spreadsheets. But safe to say, as, as a business analyst, as I am in my regular life, uh, for those of you curious, I look at telecoms and networking and stuff like that. As, as an analyst... Um, Oftentimes you're just you know you're just trying to figure out how much money a company makes. You know you're trying to sit there and you're trying to say, okay, well I need to figure out the size of this market, and I can't do that because I don't know how much money this company makes. So I need to start making S's and guesstimations. By the way, this is my R two D two mug. Uh, please appreciate it. Um, oh, talking makes you very thirsty. Um, okay, and then you sit down and do a calculation, you know, profit, loss, likely expenditure, that kind of thing. So when you're sitting down to work out how much an LCG costs, it's actually not that complicated because you think it would be, or how much profit it generates, for example. You think it would be, but actually, you know, when it came to something like Legend of the Five Rings, we knew roughly how many staff were working on it um, and like what percentages of the marketing people's time, just based on our interactions with them, were dedicated to it. And we knew the price and the end price of the packs was um, £13 UK. I think it was $15 US. And we knew how much the stores, because I know some stores, and how much the distributors, because I know some distributors, and how much all of those guys were paying for the packs and, and how much was actually just going straight back to the company. Right? We also knew, based on a player census that the company had given us, and they told us roughly how many players they had, um, we knew roughly how many active players there were. There were people who would buy every single card, about five, six, seven thousand. We didn't know exactly how many casual players there were, so we could estimate that. And we knew the price of big boxes and all these other kind of stuff. So putting all those together, you could work out how much the ongoing costs of this thing was, how much they were paying the developers um, based on market rates, that kind of thing. And you try and figure out how much profit and loss. Now, I'm not going to go into the numbers because um, let's just say you know, we weren't very confident in our actual forecast. So the number had about 200,000 pound variance, which is huge. But equally, you know, even with that variance, it's still good to be able to say, well, it's probably in the range of, you know, two to 300,000 pounds, right? You know, two to 400,000 pounds, whatever. Um, so work out how much money an LCG actually makes. And the answer is it's not that much because the average revenue generated per gamer is set. They either buy everything, something or nothing, right? The upwards cap of what you can sell to them, everything, something or nothing, the upwards cap of what you can sell to a lifetime Legend of the Five Rings, now the game's completed, player is about 550 quid. You can sell playmats as well, maybe, okay, maybe like 600 quid. You can't go above that because there's nothing else to sell. them. Um, the only other thing you can do is put on events for them. But, you know, and this is where it comes, this is kind of like a money-making crux of a difference between the two. Um, what is the purpose of running an event for an LCG? Because everyone there has already bought all of your product in order to compete at that event. So the only real reason to 
run those events is to want, make give people a reason to keep playing that game, to keep buying, and basically keep paying you £100 a year. But how many events is it worth running for £100 a year per person? How much money are you generating from that event? Two, three pounds once you've paid for fees, judges, staff, all that kind of stuff. So then running events for an LCG, you know, you're not really producing enough product that you're selling on a regular basis to make those events really worthwhile, but you need to do them if you're running a competitive game or people will stop playing your game. So, you know, competitive LCGs are this really tricky monster where the cost of running the events, the cost of keeping a community going, running marketing, you know, all those things, are they really borne by the cost of the product? And I think this is the central cost, the central question of this section of the video. And obviously I'll have timestamps and there's timestamps probably. So if you just jumped here and you skipped all the other stuff because you're like, look, Finbar, I need to know about these financials. I need to know how much money you reckon people are making, right? So if you just look at that, right? 5,000 players, each product costs 15. They're releasing 10 to 12 products a year. You know, on average, if every single one of those players bought everything, you'd be talking about 50, 60, 000, you know, not a huge amount of money, right? But it does, it does, it does scale up um, because, you know, there are supplementary products and things like that. But the point is that the money isn't there and the products aren't there to consistently run a solid event schedule, to consistently pay marketing staff and generate a huge profit. And when you add in the fact that Asmodee bought Fantasy Flight Games and is clearly squeezing them for every penny and they fired loads of people and then they fired all their OP staff when COVID hit and they fired marketing people and all of a sudden your marketing people have left because they were being they they weren't going to pay them and you know all that other stuff you can see that really the LCG model doesn't generate enough money. And what this came down to and when we did our calculations is that if you consider everything to be you know in order to make as much profit as they could from from a game like Legend of the Five Rings, for example, um, Fantasy Flight Games really only felt comfortable paying um, one developer after the game was was made, right? And that developer as well, we'll assume um, because he was an intern who then became the developer of the project, probably wasn't on like a senior developer's wages. Um, you know, if he's listening to this video, sorry, mate, but my guess is you weren't on a senior developer's wages. Um, so we're going to say that they were paying, say, a roughly maybe junior developer, junior to medium uh, developers wages. Um, and then he was also put on other projects and they're paying half a developer's wages. Uh, and they really weren't willing to pay more for a, for a two developers or three developers. When, as most people would guess, to design a competitively balanced game, not a board game where, you know, people can chop and change if things are too powerful for their tabletop. Uh, or a co cooperative LCG where, again, there's an element of self-balancing because if something's too strong, people will just be like, look, can you not put that card in this time because that's too strong? And that kind of thing in a co competitive game where people are going to play cards unless you take them away. Um, to truly design and balance one of those takes more than more than one person thoroughly. And then you look at a trading card game where people are spending £300 a box, where stores are paying... Now, I know this because I've been listening to Alpha Investments and other channels like that. Uh, stores are paying, what, £70 a box to Wizard and then selling that on, making their own profits. But, you know, 70 to 80 $80 or whatever for a box and then selling it on and making, making a bit of a markup. Um, so, you know, if that's all going to Wizards and they're, you know, how many boxes of a set is each store buying? You know, a couple hundred. Um, so, you know, instantly you begin to see the, the huge difference in terms of revenue generated for the company that makes it, right? Um, LCGs pretty much generate what I would consider to be board game level revenue, uh, whereas TCGs generate revenue much, much higher than that, which in turn leads to all of the perks. It leads to more designers. It leads to paid playtesters. It leads to rigorous playtesting because if you mess up a set, people aren't going to buy it and suddenly you know, your stores hate you because they're not selling the product. It leads to, you know, incentive to continue running high quality events, uh, casual events, competitive events, whatever, for people because you want them to keep buying your product and keep running Sealed and Friday Night Magic and whatever Flesh and Blood's version of Friday Night Magic is going to be when stores open and, and all those other kind of things. So, you know, the very fact is, and this, this is simply what it comes down to, if you think about the amount of money that an LCG makes versus a TCG, we are really talking about very, very small sums to huge sums, right? 
And it's not true of every TCG. Obviously, there are niche TCGs that don't make that much money. You know, as far as I know, Shadow Fist is still being printed. That's an old one. Uh, and there's loads of smaller ones. But the fact is, just in terms of revenue, not only do LCGs make less money, there is less incentive to keep an LCG crowd constantly engaged with your game because stores aren't making money from them um, in terms of regular sealed events. They will literally just sell one pack to one person once a month which is not a good revenue generator for stores. So stores don't want to stock it or get, you know, invest the time. You're not making that much money from it, so you don't want to invest the time. There was not even a Legend of the Five Rings or a demo for any LCG except Marvel, which is, again, Marvel. Um, so that's a whole other thing. At any of the um, FFG stands for the past three years, even when the game was going strong, they were not demoing it to people. Um, because, well, there, there were many reasons it was too complicated, but it was also just because it's not the big money. If someone comes to your stand and they buy uh, Twilight Imperium, you know, that's £80. Um, if they buy a core set of Alpha Val, that's 30 but then you don't have the rest in stock because why are you bringing all of it to the event? You're not doing that. So, but they could buy Marvel Champions, that'd be 60 quid. You know, there's lots of nice revenue generators of which LCGs are not one of them. Um, so that's kind of the two main topics I want to get into, and I'm you know, cautious that this video is getting quite long, but I feel like we've covered a lot of the ground that I wanted to cover in this big think piece in terms of LCGs or TCGs. Um, and I guess the final point is why you, as a player, should choose one model or the other, right? Simple pros and cons. Right. So if you primarily want to play sealed, so you want to do drafting, you want to play a lot of variance decks. So you want to play lots of decks that change. You want to play lots of different sets a year, and you just want to play small amounts of those sets in a sealed environment where everyone is theoretically on an equal playing field. Then you have to play TCGs. There are draft versions in LCGs, but they typically involve owning the entire card pool, which can be a big outlay. And of course, you have to construct the draft pool from that cards that you own, meaning that you cannot simultaneously have both decks and a card pool unless you buy two collections right big problem so you know cost to play sealed of an lcg five six hundred quid cost to play sealed of um a trading card game at least once you know it's 10 pounds obviously you're going to spend a lot more but that's on you you know how much you want to play sealed right so if you're the sort of person who wants to play sealed you're obviously always playing a tcg it's not the drafting isn't fun in lcgs it requires a lot more work and you know you have to really like the lcg to want to draft it put it that way um if you want to play um regular you know store supported like heavily supported um events with you know you know huge communities like huge communities like massive massive events then you have to play a trading card game they're the only things that get to that scale um stores all love them because they make lots of money um you know, and that's it. Okay, there's no other option really. There are competitive events for LCGs, or there were um, until this last one got cancelled. You know, but if you wanted to play like Netrunner, for example, um, uh, Nisei, the continuing committee for Netrunner, ran the World Championships, had 300 people. You know, that's not Magic the Gathering or Pokemon levels, but it is a consistent and solid community that has a high level competitive element. So. There are, you know, you could play an LCG and be a very strong competitive player. And in fact, this is, comes on to the next point. So I want to play the cutting edge of the latest meta in the game, right? And I want to play it with a consistent competitive environment that values competition and takes the game very seriously. And the true answer here is either just pick based on how much money you have to spend, right? And how much money you're willing to spend on an annual basis, right? So if, and, and, and the theme as well. So if you like cyberpunk and you're only willing to spend 50, 60, 100 quid a year on a game, then you should start playing Netrunner because it has a really strong competitive scene. Uh, Nisei do rotations all the time. Um, it has a really fun asymmetrical style of gameplay. But those are gameplay elements. On the, on the more LCG versus TCG elements, you know how much you're paying every year. You get a three copies of every card. You can build any deck in the meta. You can be a top meta player with a meta collection for a set amount every year. And you can really, really get into every single release that comes out because you don't have to worry that suddenly it's going to cost you loads more because that card became rare and then it spiked and then, oh God, how do I keep up, right? So if, if your budget is your primary concern 
and you're not looking at theme and things like that. You just want to, I know I want to play a competitive game, but I don't have the budget to play a huge game. Then you need to look at stuff like, you know, you need to look at some of the living card games. Ashes Reborn should have a tournament scene of some kind. Netrunner has a fantastic tournament scene. Uh, my own favorite, Legend of the Five Rings, may have a fan tournament scene in a year or two. So you can have a look at that. Though the game as it is now may not look like it does in the future. Who knows um, if it keeps going or whatever. My point is that LCGs are a perfectly viable model if budget is one of your main considerations. Okay, moving beyond that. If you want to play something that changes a lot, and I mean like a lot as in I want a meta that changes every three months to four months and you're, you don't care about money, then you're going to a trading card game. You're going into standard and you're going into, you know, you're going into that where there's going to be a new set every three months. It's going to have loads of cards in and you're going to you're going to constantly be buying, chasing cards like you want that big secondary market. You want to be chasing cards. You want to be building those decks. You just TCG all the way. Right. And that's basically what it comes down to. If you are a casual player with a reasonably strong local community, you just want a small group of people, 20, 30 people who really like playing a game and they all want to buy in. You don't want to have this weird price thing. You don't want to be haggling with your friends or trading with your friends. You don't want a room full of bulk. I mean, seriously, if I start, I'm not going to turn the camera, but like, let's just turn to the left. Here's a, here's a welcome to Wraithbox. I've got 10 more back there. And I mean, okay, this isn't exactly bulk because, you know, we've got a play set of Command and Conquer and we've got a play set of um, Ancestral Empowerment foils here. And, you know, here's my Metacarpus and here's a Storm Striders and here's the Cold Foil Crucible and here's my Tunic. So this, this isn't bulk, but my point is this box has a lot of, you know, this box is the only box I have that isn't full of bulk. I've got loads more behind me. You know, I've got Lord of the Rings. I've got Lord of the Rings bulk right here. This is a starter deck from 20 years ago. Piles and piles of, of bulk. So if you don't want bulk, if you want a set collection that's really neat and tidy um, and that just gets updated with an expansion every now and then, go for an LCG. You know, if your partner is concerned about how much you're paying, going to pay for a card game, play an LCG. And ultimately, I would say, if you've got a small community and you want to get all of them involved in the game, um, play an LCG. Pick one you really like, cooperative, competitive, you know, Netrunner, great one, as I said. Uh, Legend of the Five Rings is finished now. If you and a community want to get all of Legend of the Five Rings and just play with it for like three or four years, there's five years worth of cards there. It could be a great experience. It's a bit of a heavy game, but if that's what you want, then go for it. Marvel Champions, cooperative, but, you know, can be a lot of fun. Arkham Horror really appeals to small groups. But then something like Ashes Reborn, which is just relaunched, um, you know, that's going to be a one versus one competitive card game. And as I said earlier in this video, the buy in is anywhere from 20 pounds up to, you know, 30, 40 pounds just for the to get in for the dice and, you know, to get your first deck. But you can stop there. You know, you're just like, look, I really like bears. I want to play bears. So you buy Rin, who's got these bears that he plays, these frost bears, and he buffs the bears and the bears attack. And you're just like, ah, you know, you're me and I will play Rin. Um, I will also play basically the Ashes Reborn version of Red Dead Wins because I like burning people. And then I play Kano and Flesh and Blood for the same reason. But um, my point is that if, you, if you've got that tight-knit community, you're looking for something with a set price point to pay LCG every way. But you could also consider, and this is important, running that kind of pauper, sealed um, TCG model, right? There are loads of small communities that are running, say... And actually, I really like this format. It's basically called Scalable Sealed. So we start off with six packs and a sealed deck week one. We play that two weeks in a sort of league. Then we add another six packs from the same set, play that for another two weeks. Then you have a trade day where everyone comes in at the weekend and people can trade between their different sets. Or you skip that if you think it's going to leave someone overpowered. But basically, the idea is that everything has the same value because everyone is playing within the same pool. So if I trade you my, you know, blue card for your red card, but you were never going to play red, then the blue card and the red card have the same value, even though they're both mythics. And theoretically, in the external market, one might be worth fifty quid and one might be worth twenty. But that doesn't matter because you're playing in that sealed environment and you have that little agreement. And then you can scale that up to the point where, you know, depending on how the card game you're playing, you add another set, you add in another six boosters until, you know, you're six months down the line and you've, 
you know, you've slowly built collections for people while also playing in a format that's, that values low power and values um, making the most of what you have and, you know, mixing things up and trying new things with th the resources available to you. So, you know, there are options for that, that same sort of small community playing by their own rules. Um, and, you know, you kind of see it with games like Magic where the most popular format in my local shop is not modern it's not standard yes they ran the old school world cup which is only cards printed in 1994 1993 to magic um where every deck is worth like two hundred thousand pounds yeah they ran that and they had 80 people but if you go in there on a weekday pre-covid what are you going to see you're going to see 10 people sitting at the same table playing commander playing edh you know they're not they're playing by their own rules they're having fun so you can do that in either model I think LCGs are great for that, especially because they have a transparent, um, they have a transparent uh, regular cost and a cap on buy-in. But if you set up certain rules within your TCG, you too can play, um, you too can play that. So that's kind of really, I mean, that's kind of really my main takeaways from here. There are valuable reasons that both models should exist. Which do I personally prefer? I have played an LCG for years. Um, and this came up in my last video. People were like, why are you now playing Flesh and Blood? It's the CCG. You said you would never play a CCG again. They burn through your wallet. And, you know, Finbar, you just told me you had 10 boxes behind you and you have 10 boxes of Monarch pre ordered. Like, what are you doing? That's like, you know, there's a thousand pounds, right? What are you doing? When you, you know, you said that that was a big reason. You know, money is a big reason you're not getting into a CCG again. Okay. But money is also the reason I did get into a CCG again. What do I prefer? I prefer an LCG. I love a really well managed LCG where I don't have to feel guilty that not everyone in my group, my play group, can afford all the cards. Um, where everyone has this, a flat idea and can set aside, even if they're on, you know, they're working in a coffee shop or something like that, they can set aside ten pounds a month to buy the latest LCG pack. And as a harmonious community, we can make formats like Corset Plus One, etc., to entertain ourselves and run our own events if the company isn't providing support for it. Um, you know, I think that's really good. But, and here's the big but, I want, and this is what ultimately pushed me towards Flesh and Blood, but I wanted a game where I felt like the company was putting as much investment into it as I was. Right? And that's that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's why I'm now doing videos um, beyond L5R, is I want a game where I feel like the company is putting as much investment as I am into the game. So if I am super committed, they also are super committed to making me happy as a player. Whatever that means. If that means reprinting cards that are really in demand that are too expensive. So like reprinting Tunic of Findal in Crucible of War. Um still, you know, we had the unlimited announcement earlier today, so that price is coming down. Reprinting magic staples in a corset, whatever. Um running regular events, doing good price support talking just talking in fact one of the things that um lcgs have historically been bad at because they didn't make the money um in order to justify it was just having good marketing having a marketing team that was willing to come into the trenches with you and tell you why and what they were doing and you know explain why things were going on you know why is this card good why is that card bad more importantly i want us i want a game where if i spend my hundred pounds on a new set i'm getting a set that was designed by many people had a lot of put thought and energy put into it because it's a good product it was a money maker for the company so they were willing to spend to get a better product because they know if they release a bad set they'll lose customers and lcgs traditionally have not had to invest in much in development because they know that people are buying their model because it's cheap and they'll keep buying it even though there's a few dud cards in it and you know things have suffered because of that so why to play an lcg over a tcg um cost is a reason but cost is also a reason to play a tcg because my collection theoretically of my l5r cards is maybe worth 400 quid if i could get everyone to buy it my promo collection if the secondary market continues is probably worth about the same you know there's there's world's promos in there that people might still pay 20 quid for a card but are they going to for much longer is it going to be a collector's item into the future I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, whereas, you know, if Flesh and Blood continues to be popular, will my foil legendary equipments drop in price? Probably not. The fact that they're unlimited of early printings might be important if I keep them in good condition. 
Probably not, but you know, they are not worth theoretically what I got them for, right? You know, if I pay a hundred pounds and then I sell them next year for a hundred quid, that's not depreciated value. That's fine. And if I play them in that period of time and the company I bought them from is investing loads of money as LSS games are into price support, then that's not worth it. that's worth it too. So money ultimately it is everything it comes down to. And when I spend money on a new game like Flesh and Blood and I see the things they're doing to support the game, like air freighting the latest set from Belgium across the world, and um, which is expensive as hell because they were worried it would be too delayed, like controlling and reprinting cards that they're worried about getting too valuable so people can't afford them anymore. And even just the separation of the collector's edition from the unlimited is kind of important. And we'll get into this a bit more in my flesh and blood video, which I'm doing in a second, but um, you know, having a first edition that is special and all the collectors are gonna chase, and the value of that is gonna go crazy, being followed up by an unlimited edition, which is, you know, by specific um, you know, statement going to be printed if the prices go too high on certain cards is just going to be reprinted to control the value of people getting in is important, right? So let the let the collectors go crazy after over their cold foil legendaries, their gold foil legendaries. But as long as you can buy the legendary for a class for about 70, 80 quid, right? And, you know, that's the equivalent of a playset of four of the best rare in Magic in Standard, right? You're good. Like, that's a good entry point. And, you know, I think it's just so important. So... There you go, there you have it. There's my LCG versus TCG video. Um, I hope you found this enlightening. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. Um, I am trying to do more of these. I would like people to feel like I have things to say that are worthwhile. And, you know, if you want more of this content, let me know. Um, yeah, and that's it, really. So have a good one, and I will speak to you soon.